So the song Boys to Men <laughs> comes to mind, Daphne. It's so hard to say goodbye. So hard. Is it? No. I and mean, this is the end of season one, right? It's just the end of season one. Yeah. So, and we're, we'll be, well, there will be other seasons, we think. I mean, we're, we're planning on it. We're planning on it. We're, we're it. anticipating it with yes. wild expectation. And reckless abandon. And reckless abandon. <laughs> Chasing after the adventure. We are going to be wrapping up this final episode for season one of the life, the ultimate choose your own adventure game. Welcome to life, the ultimate choose your own adventure game with hosts Cliff Ravenscraft and Daphne Scott. Join this dynamic duo as they explore the profound concept of life as a thrilling adventure, blending ancient wisdom and modern psychology. Embrace the joy of living with presence, creativity, and playfulness. It's time to navigate the game of life together. Are you ready to play? Let the adventure begin. So you know what stood out to me, Daphne? No, what? That life is nothing more than just this profound concept. Cliff, the profound concept of life stood out to me today. This is twice now. <laughs> and I was laughing. I was kind of laughing at myself because, you know, we write these. In this case, I wrote this script, you know, kind of put it together. But I was like, <laughs> the profound concept of life. I, lo- so I know. It, it, and what it gets me is it's like, is it, is it really profound? <laughs> it's just a concept. It's just a concept. It's just another concept. Relax. <laughs> I know that we're wrapping up season one here of the yeah. podcast, and I know that we're going to do a review, but I, and no, and actually, yeah. I want to tell you something about okay. a book that I've been reading by oh. Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. called The Five oh. Levels of Attachment. Five levels. Yeah, it's The Five Levels of Attachment. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is a fascinating read. I mean, I'm aware of just like either you're attached or not. I did not recognize. So five there is this amazing metaphor that he gives at the open of the book to describe the five levels of attachment. And it's okay. somebody. So I think the five levels of attachment, I'm just doing this from memory. I've only read through this book once and I'm almost finished with it. But the five levels, first of all, is not attachment. It's the authentic self. All right? okay. It's the core okay. of your being. And then the attachment, he refers to it, the way that I'm picking it up is that he refers to knowledge is what we actually become attached to. That knowledge is just the oh, things we agree upon. Knowledge is the beliefs that we hold. Okay. And and so that So like the certain like the certainty? Certainty, but just, yeah, knowledge. Yeah. It's just knowledge. things okay. you know, all right? Yeah, okay. So the okay. idea is that you're at, at, at level one, your authentic self, you're not attached to any of that knowledge. You just be. Okay. All right? You, there, there is, you don't need any thought to feel worthy. You are worthy by being. That, that's okay. the authentic being. I'm oversimplifying this thing, obviously. You know the Dunning Crooner effect? Yes. I, I'm high on the chart of like the, <laughs> you know, that, that first ignorance is bliss kind of thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on top of that hill. So, so there's the authentic being. Then there is preference, hmm. the attachment at a preference level. Okay. And okay. This, this I'm getting this now. This is good. Okay. So preference. Okay. So preference. Yeah. He he gave the illustration of somebody who's a sporting fan, somebody who likes soccer or what they would call football in other places, and he says that somebody who is an authentic being who goes to level one, the neck, the first level of attachment, is someone who is able to go and attend a sporting event, enjoy it for what it is get excited about it, have a preference about something, you know, it's just like, sure. I just go, but then, then they're able to walk away. And it's, it's, it's like that game doesn't leave with them. There is no thought about it. There's no attachment to, ha- it, they don't care who won. They just were well, happy it ruins to be my day there. When my team doesn't win. It, well, <laughs> that's a level of attachment. So, so there's preference. Then there's identity. 
okay. is a level of attachment. Yeah. And then there's a level of attachment. It goes all the way down to what's called fanaticism. And, and just it's how much you actually are going up and down these different levels. It's whether or not you retain your level of awareness of yourself being the authentic being, or have you actually clouded your image of yourself and now you believe that you are your identity, you are, you believe that you are what you know. Uh, yeah. It just is such a fascinating book. I, I just wanted to, first and foremost, <laughs> share it with you, Daphne, as a lover of these kind of things. But yes. since I was gonna share it with you, I thought, what better, Thing to do than to leave the season by giving another one of these Toltec wisdom books a shout out and let people go in and read and enjoy. Well, I'm so glad you shared it with me. And you do know I love these things, these books and anything on consciousness. I mean, this is the work we do in the world and with ourselves. And just for, for those who may not know, we did a podcast on the four agreements, which is the book written by Don Miguel Ruiz. I guess I'll say senior mm -hmm. in this case. And it sounds like in this book was written by his son. So yes. the five levels of attachment. Okay. And there's yeah. an entire between Don Miguel Ruiz uh, Ruiz Sr., Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., and Don Miguel Jose, which the uh, the, the the other two are Don Miguel's sons. There's okay. an entire series of books that yeah. are part of what they call the Toltec Wisdom series. And I have not failed to absolutely love every single one of these books. I'm so great. So that the five levels reminded me as you were as you were describing all of them. It's like the pants are just getting tighter and tighter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Like like and we just get attached. Like it, like it's just sucking us in. Like we're constricted. We just cannot move at all. Yeah. Right? And, and one of the things that I loved about it is that there's at one level where you have identity. You you identify with your beliefs, but you yeah. are, but you're totally okay, and you can and you can have relationship with other people who have alternative beliefs. Yeah, yeah. But well, as, you know, as you get deeper into the levels, all the way to fanaticism, you're willing to kill for your beliefs. Yes, and at that point, you know, I think it's where when you were describing a level, well, I think it was level one, where there's just no. Well, or is level one knowledge and there's a there's like a I level can't zero. remember. I'm gonna I'm okay. gonna look well, it up here. Whatever. But you know, it just it reminds me of just you know we as we get identified, it, you know we become identified with the content of our lives. So we forget that we are the context. Yes. Like our right. So we become identified with content, which another way of saying content is thoughts, beliefs, ideas, these things that we've talked about this pretty you know, many times on the show, like these things that are just coming and going and we forget <laughs> we attach to those things. Right. And then how, how hard we, I love that there's the five levels, how hard I would say, how hard, how much we get attached to those things. Then, you know, we lose sight of the fact that we're just the context. Yeah. <laughs> or oh, just a concept. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to what, so, and that's why it stood out to me, the concept of life. So yeah, just, so good. just for clarity and to stay aligned with what the book actually says here, level one of attachment is our authentic self. There is a, because it, because it, the actual self is mm -hmm. that, that feeling of individualization. So there is some level of attachment to actually the I, when the I is born, the, yeah. it, it, the I am this. So so level one is the authentic self. Level two is preference. Level three is identity. Level four is internalization. And if I'm not mistaken, internalization is where you begin to domesticate yourself. And okay. you are also attempting to domesticate others. And then oh. level five is fanaticism. And that's when uh, you actually, it, it is your all out duty in some way to convert everyone to your way of seeing things. <laughs> it always goes well. <laughs> and, and what one of the things I love about it is it's it says that at the core, the people have such an attachment to their beliefs that they genuinely believe that what they're doing is out of love, even yeah. when they're harming. Yeah. 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 I mean... I would say that is the foundation of all and every war, yeah. whether it be a traditional, you know, in the traditional context or the war within ourselves. Yeah, 
I I loved it. I, as I was sitting there reading it, it's like, oh my gosh, I have been going up and down these levels <laughs> for the last several years. And I went into chat GPT on the way to the gym and I said, hey, I'd like you. I, I said, first of all, are you familiar with this book? And GPT says, yes. And I, I'm like, great. I would like to give you, ask you to give me a list of journal prompts that you could ask me so I can evaluate at any given moment, where am I in the in my levels of attachment? And it came out with this amazing set of beliefs. Or, Do you or, remember or, any of the, yeah, any of the get, prompts that gave you curious? Yeah, let me, let me pull it up one. here. Yeah. This is one of yeah. the things I love about ChatGPT. You can have these conversations and everything's all in there. So, well, because one thing, one thing I would add while you're looking for that is, you know, being able to identify where we're at in our consciousness is so critical, you know, and, you know, where are we getting more constricted or where are we really open? And then being able to be honest with ourselves <laughs> and with others about it too. You know, I think there's nothing, I don't know about you, but I think there's nothing more freeing than for me to say to, you know, my best buddy, I'm really, I'm just very attached right now to yeah. my perspective and I'm, I'm going to just stay attached to it for the time being. <laughs> I, I just, got, right. It just, it I just be, ends all the drama at that point, you know? So, so what I, what happened for me this week, r the day before I read this book, it was, it was funny because I would have told you I was triggered. Right. Okay. And, and I okay. had this experience that I was triggered and I had this immediate negative emotional response to something. And I, I, I was aware that it was happening. And, and I'm like, I, I, I just, uh, and it was, I was frustrated. Yeah. However, the very next morning or very next day, I'm reading this book and I'm like, wait a second. Now I'm actually aware of the fact that I was triggered and that wasn't me. And, yeah. and, and it's like, uh, so here are the questions. All right. I said, <laughs> okay. um, uh, she said, ChatGPT says, that's a great idea. Here are some questions inspired by the five levels of attachment to help evaluate your attachment le level of attachment. Question number one, what belief or idea am I currently strongly attached to? Yeah. By the way, good. this reminds me a lot that's of good. Byron Katie's The Work. It absolutely is. I mean, I think that, you know, again, a thousand, we're going to get to this in the show too, but a thousand skillful means, right? I yes. mean, you I mean, I, I think that's, I think that's number, the number one point <laughs> we're going to in our summary today, but a thousand skillful means, you know, there's Byron Katie's work, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, there's this book that you're reading, you know, and it's that willingness. And one of the things I appreciate about you too, Cliff, it's that willingness to go on an adventure, to try these different things. And also to recognize that maybe what was impactful before that worked well may not be working now. Yes. Right. And so discovering, discovering different ways. And there are a thousand skillful means to work with ourselves and develop self-awareness. And I love it. All yeah. Right. It is a lot like Brian Katie's work in that way. All right. Seven questions. The first one, what belief or idea am I currently strongly attached to? Number two, what does this belief influence or how does this belief influence my daily thoughts and actions? Oh my gosh. Good thing to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, can I identify moments when this belief has limited my perspective or choices? Almost always. All right. <laughs> Number four, how does this belief align with my true values and who I want to be? Number five, am I open to questioning or changing this belief if new information or experiences arise? These are great questions. Number six, what feelings arise when I think about losing my attachment to this belief? And then oh. number seven, how would my life change if I released some of the attachment to this belief? It would be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's like, this is like, ah. And, yeah. and as I'm reading the book, it, it immediately lifted me out of what Hindus would call the Maya, the illusion, yeah. what the Toltecs would say is the Maitoti. And it's yeah. like, it's like, the ah, Buddhists would call the Samsara. Exactly. It's like, oh my gosh, as I'm sitting here, it's like, wow, 
I see is I see I'm aware it's like yes I this yes. is where I've been I went deep I went all in I said I'm in this thing <laughs> I'm fully playing this part and and I was doing this it well the way it's supposed to be yes and it's not and now I'm upset <laughs> ah. I know you'll read this book Daphne because I know who you are oh yeah I will so yeah. I can't wait till you read the soccer metaphor and see how the soccer metaphor that he does in the open of the book applies to everything, including religion, which is and politics is the two big things. But still, oh, yeah. Oh my gosh, is it like? I really do. I don't know. So I have two comments. One is I don't know if you've noticed that, like, when we get hit, or or if this has been part of your experience, but it's absolutely been part of mine. When I become very attached to my belief or the way that something should be. I notice that I become the thing that I'm criticizing. <laughs> like, for example, I don't know why people just can't enjoy their lives more and be happy and be grateful for the things. This is what happened yesterday. Yeah. Which is why Byron Katie gives offers the turnaround. Yes. And it's like we be, I mean, I just think that's always a that's always one of my hallmark signatures like for me catching myself because I'm becoming that which I am pointing the finger at. I'm becoming that which I'm judging or criticizing. That's how I know I'm hooked. And that's like, okay. In a way there's yeah. a theory out there or a philosophy that talks about everyone is a mirror. Yeah. It, th yeah. They're a reflection of what's going on. So yes. our experience of them is actually a reflection of what we're, what we've got going on internally. Exactly. Exactly. And so I could, I can hear the, you know, the little chirping that starts, you know, and I'm like, I just always laugh at myself about it, but I, I don't, so I don't know if that's, you've had that experience or noticed that. Oh yeah. Because you were talking about, yeah, what are these beliefs doing and how am I walking through the world when I'm attached to this belief? And I'm like, you will become exactly the thing that you're criticizing. It's, you can't not do it. Well, yeah. there's a scripture in the Bible that says, uh, don't judge others for the exact measure that you judge others. Me for the exact method and measure that you judge others, measure for measure, you will be judged. So don't, <laughs> don't judge others because you will be judged. And yeah. in essence, what, what, I'm, what comes up for me as I evaluate that now through my experience and lens after broadening my understanding of this, that's not necessarily like this idea of reincarnation, although I can see how some people would uh, pull in that flavor of, of thought and philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. But the reality for me has been that when I am judging others, then what I am saying is that I, I am stating a belief that something that I prefer is better than something yes. else and therefore you have the capacity to be wrong yes. and, if, and, and in the event that you have the capacity to be wrong and that you should be judged by someone such as myself that in turn means that now i have the capacity to be, to be wrong and i'm open to self-judgment and self-criticism and yes. it's like it, it just doesn't stop and so that's why i think really love is the answer <laughs> it is the answer and don't you find, at least for me, I find it so freeing when I let go of any idea that I'm right about anything. I think it is just the ultimate experience I've had over and over again of letting go of any sense of being right about anything. It's, it's just been the ultimate, it, it has been the ultimate um, it, part of my existence of just feeling free. Yeah. I will say that the freest I've ever felt is when I let go of all of my judgments, all yeah. of my conclusions, all yeah. of my, I am right about this. <laughs> and when I open myself to say, you know what? I don't in, I can say from my perception of where I am right now, I can't find any agreement with what this person is saying and or doing. However, I'm open to the possibility that there's something they know that I don't know. They're perceiving yeah. something that I'm not perceiving. And while yes. their experience is different from mine, I the true freedom for me is when I could see it, not find agreement, and yet at the same time not pass judgment on it. I think that's the key. I mean, as soon as you start 
as soon as the judgment starts, then I mean, that's the, that's the hook, right? I mean, that's it. Then you, you have taken a position and it's just lovely not to have one. Well, it's also it, lovely to know what you desire, right? That's fine. It just doesn't mean that you're right about what that person's path is or what that, what that life journey is for them or what they're doing or what's happening. I mean, it's just, that's the freedom part of it. I'm like, I, I don't know, you know? <laughs> well, we talk about the freedom part of it. The thought that comes up for me is that at some level, we get deeper into these levels of attachment to, mm-hmm. if you will, choose our own adventure in the game of life. And at at some level, we if we are going to be fully invested in the profound concept of life that we have, we sometimes do need to get identified to some beliefs for sure. our society to work, for the dream of the planet to work. There needs to be some agreement upon what symbols such as words mean. And there, you know, and and there there absolutely at, at some level there's there's there needs to be a level of what do we as a society, whether it is our local culture of our family, our city, our state, our country, about what's right and what's wrong and all this other stuff. And so while at many levels I see the need for us to attach ourselves to some knowledge and hold mm-hmm. some deeply held beliefs to it, it does actually come with some consequences, <laughs> such as disagreement, conflict, war, and all sorts of other stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think at that point you're making the choices about how far, you know, again, how constricted do you become, right? Is it is an idea worth killing <laughs> for, right? I mean, those are, those are the things that I think you're talking about that this book is pointing out too. It's the more attached you become, you only have, you only have so many choices, yeah. right? Because the more attached I become, then I have to X you out because you, you are up against my choice now. Right. And I start to see that as a threat. And yeah. that's the key is that the idea is that this can be an intentional choice. Yeah. Now, you know why I'm so obsessed with the word and. <laughs> I do. I am. I am enjoying the word and. I. I still. There are sometimes when I. I catch myself even when Daphne's not around. You know, there. There. There's not even the the little Daphne on my shoulder. Every now and then, I find myself in the middle of a solo hosted piece of content that I'm creating, and I say the word "but," and I'm like, I stop, and I'm like, and I'm like, no, and doesn't work. This one is definitely a but. I love it because, and so it forces you to have to resolve that two things can be true. Yes. That two, right? I mean, it forces you to have to sit in that. One of my teachers, I think I said this, I might've said this, but one of my teachers' greatest example, he would, he did a lot with relationships and coaching and so he was a psychologist. He's great. And he would say, you know, I love you and your feet stink. Like you had to resolve. (laughs) It's an example that you love this person and there was something about them that absolutely was untoward that you did not enjoy at all. And you had to reserve that you were a person who could love a person whose feet stink. Yes. So, okay. (laughs) Daphne, I'm okay. This wasn't in our rundown because I looked at a rundown. This isn't one of the five things we're summarizing the key takeaways of our season one, but, and so there, so there we go. Right. But yeah, it's like this wasn't there, but I want to say something else. I want to include something And my thought. So, so my question for you, do you never say the word, but do you think there's ne- like, I want to say, I know this wasn't included. However, but we did discuss, this is one of these things. This is one of those little quirks that came out of our conversation. It came up yeah. in our coaching from time to time. But since we've been having these weekly podcast episodes, this topic of using and instead of but has become a topic of conversation. And I have been awakened to a lot of opportunities of where it can be an expanding way of thinking. But, or and, and I'm wondering, is there ever a time where the word but is appropriate? That That's, you know, probably. I mean, I don't know. You know, it obviously the word exists. So somebody found it useful. I, and well, I don't it, know is that it I, just because somebody needed something to sit on? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a but with two T's. <laughs> Fair enough. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, and I wouldn't, I would never go as far to say that I never say, I mean, I don't, you know, never and always are, are strange places to play, but you know, but, um, there you go. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's a place. What I do know that is is when I'm working with people or if we're in a conversation and I say, you know, Cliff, I heard what you said, but there's just that moment of like that. I I get that. Right. Like what you just said, I'm going to just sweep it over here or, Hey, you put the, the summary together. This wasn't on it, you know, but I'm going to say this anyway. You know, there's just that moment of like, it's, it has this sort of dismissive sort of right. Versus, Hey, I heard what you said. And I got what you said. And I want to add to, I want to add to this to it. And it could be completely opposite. Like I hear that you're saying, See, I you want to go. I didn't think. I didn't even think of a, a the p- possibility of a dis. The f- the first scenario you gave, mm-hmm. I definitely felt the dismissive nature of that. I hear what you're saying, but I want you yeah. to know this. Yeah. So that I can. It's like no. I and is be- much. But I I see the relevancy of and there. Hmm. Yeah. W- when I said, I know that we have this outline of the five things that, you know, for the season, blah, blah, blah. But I want to add this here. I, I, I want to add this topic. However, I'd like to also include this. It's kind of like what I'm saying. Yeah. And and for me in my mind, and maybe I'm just not habitually used to it yet. This doesn't sound like it fits there. And although when you reflected it back, I did heard how I did heard. I like that. I did I like that. hear. I did hear. I like it. I did hear how that could have been interpreted as a dismissive thing. Maybe. Like, I, mean, I, didn't I, I don't think you took it that way, but I could. Uh, but I understand. Anyway, it's all. It's not all semantics. It is something I'm genuinely curious about. I I hope you're not upset that I'm taking so much of this final <laughs> episode of season one about this topic, but I'm genuinely curious about this We're word. Just and. Talk about this word. <laughs> We're gonna change the title of the episode. And or but. This is our, our final whole- episode, but we'll be back next season. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! It's, well, you know, I I would be I will be curious to see as you keep playing with this how it shows up for you. I will, yeah, I will, and you know, who knows? I'll pay attention to when I'm using the word. But one of my, you know, one of my kind of hallmark phrases I say a lot is like, either this will work out or it might not. You know, <laughs> I think it's it's holding both of those things. I think that's what I what I just watch in my consciousness is like, can I hold these? Can I hold both things? Because I know when I can then I don't get as attached. Yeah. So that's probably why the but in the and shows up for me so much. I'm not sure. It, yeah. It's interesting. Intriguing. Thank you. It is intriguing. Our incredibly aud- awesome audience for listening to me dialogue about such <laughs> a trivial concept. Not nearly no. as profound as life itself, but. Not nearly as the concept. And, and we will move and. on. Yeah. Well, we do have a little summary that we've put together. Yes, we do. We do. And we touched on point number one. So this is a summary from season one. So one of the things when we were going to wrap up season one, one of the things that I was particularly interested in is like, what was the whole, like, what did we talk about for these 25 episodes? Like, what was the point? (laughs) First of all, so where did 25 weeks go? I don't know. I feel like it was just January, a couple of weeks back, and we launched this thing. Yeah. And it's been great. And so, and I really am thrilled about us doing this in seasons. And I am thrilled also about the summary because one of the things that, and I know this is important to you and, you know, with the people that you serve and and being of service to everyone is that we can give a little bit of context around these things, because I do sort of feel like it just runs into one concept after and you're like, what am I doing? Right. And you might pick up little nuggets, but I think when, when you can get to, Hey, here are four or five things that we, you know, kind of like that we talked about. And then here are some practices and frameworks. You know, I think that's and what you were talking about with those questions from the book that you had chat, you know, GPT come up with. That starts to give you sort of like a little framework, like the journal prompts to be able to do some reflection and then change behaviors. Yes. Right. I think that's the whole point. So we have this little summary. I love it. So item number one, mindfulness as a fluid and evolving practice. Yeah. 
So a couple things that I, I wanted to bring up on this. Well, one that I've already mentioned, like there are a thousand skillful means, you know, if it's sitting still and meditating for you, great mindfulness as a, as a whole, you know, if I, if I go way up sort of the umbrella definition, it's paying, you know, I like John Kabat-Zinn's and I'm not going to quote it exactly, but definition of it, but it's paying attention on purpose right? With, with non-attachment. So it's just noticing what's happening, um, being intentional about it, knowing where we're directing our attention and putting it in a certain place and, and being aware basically is what he's saying. Oh, it's a whole idea. There are a thousand different ways to do that. <laughs> so it's, there's formal meditation practices. There's, there's being mindful when you're eating. That's yep. a big one. Like even noticing what food tastes like, what it feels like, bringing all the senses. There's a great book, um, Life in Five Senses, that I just read a couple months ago, where the author, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment, talks about our five senses and how we can bring those more into our life. So there's just a lot of, and I and I considered that book one big practice in mindfulness, really specifically around the senses. So really, in an understanding that that is an evolving thing. We don't have to get locked into one thing. Now you may find something that works really well for you. For a long time, I was a, um, the form of meditation that I practiced was more Vipassana meditation, um, more from one uh, sect of, of Buddhism. And then I switched and I do a different form of meditation, which comes more from the Dzogchen um, lineage. So now, so just things like that, that we can be really open to. And I know you've, you've, you know, we, we, you and I could probably go on and on about the practices we've had, but I think allowing ourselves the space to find what works. My only caveat around any of this is to be very careful or, um, for anyone who's starting different practices to be very careful about poo pooing any of them too soon. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I've noticed when I've done that, there's usually some, defensiveness that's come up where I'm like, well, that's stupid. You know? <laughs> that's not going to work. And I have to go back and look at myself and be like, what was that about? You know, what is it? And not saying that every, you know, don't, you're going to do everything, but it's just no. sort of being mindful. Yeah. Being aware of that. Yeah. Especially when it comes to meditation practices. Now, some people yes. just won't go into meditation because of some deeply held beliefs. And I, mm -hmm. I know when I grew up in the evangelical Christian upbringing, I was taught to stay away from any sort of Eastern meditation practice because it would be a slippery slope, lead you yeah. down some paths that are dark and dangerous and all this other stuff. <laughs> so for a long time, I not only avoided meditation, I had eerie feelings about being in relationship with people who made a regular practice of it. That was yeah. a level of attachment that I had to my beliefs that I grew up with. Yes. What I will say, though, is even people who don't have that, I have noticed that I've l attempted to introduce people to the idea and the concept of meditation, its benefits. And uh, the first thing I usually hear from most people when I introduce the topic is, yep, tried that, doesn't work for me. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, tell me more. And so they begin to tell me about a very strict type of meditative practice or the idea that they beat themselves up about is the fact that I sit there and my mind goes spinning yeah. off all these directions. And I'm like, well, depending on what meditation practice you are, you are actually doing an incredibly awesome experience of meditation. Yeah. Can I say something about this? Yeah. I think people miss the plot that <laughs> the fact that you can notice that your thinking is the whole point. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> like, like, that's what I say. Like, do you like, like it's the whole thing. Like it's crazy. And it's like, you, you miss the point, the plot, like that's the whole thing well, that you can, I'll, I'll use the word see, because who knows, but that you can see or experience a thought arising. And then, and then this is the root. It's like, Who's noticing the thought? Yeah, who am I? Yeah, who is what this? is even noticing? Who is, a, who right? is aware where, of this? Yeah, who's a, where is the thought? Where is it? I don't know. You know, I mean, that's the that's the for me anyway. That's the fun ride. Yeah, and the deeper I get into that, the deeper I get into that, that's where it just gets. It just makes me laugh. To be well, honest, I don't know why, but a lot of times I just start laughing. I think a lot of people are getting <laughs> hung up in that they believe that meditation, they've heard that it's emptying your your mind of all thought. And yeah. the idea is that you're supposed to be able to stay focused on your breath without being distracted. While there's a lot of benefit to disciplining your focus 
and yeah. and and training sure. your mind on what you desire to focus to it's not the end all be all of what all meditation practice is there there are meditation practices that do teach transcendental that you know mm-hmm. that you that you end the trance of it's thought and all yeah. of this other stuff so Anyway, th- I, yes. I yes, we could go on. I, what did you say? A thousand different skillful means. A, a thousand skillful means. Yeah. Yes, yes, to developing our awareness and our practices, our mindfulness practice, all in the spirit of, and I like to emphasize, all in the spirit of, you know, promoting our individual well-being, and also when we take care of our individual well-being, we are to we can be of much greater service to the people around us. So just, I'd like to emphasize that because I think also people can dismiss a lot of their own, you know, I'll use the term self-care that's gotten kind of um, a little washy, but I think people can miss the point that like when you're willing to do that, you really can be of great service to other people on the planet, to the other beings. So, yeah. I I just want to say one thing about mindfulness. There are actually two things about mindfulness before we move on. So mindfulness for me sometimes is driving down the road and saying, oh my gosh, I'm driving down the road. Yeah. I, wa- I want to pay attention and look around for a tree that I've never noticed before. I may have, mm-hmm. I drive to the gym back and forth the same way al- for years. Yes. And every day there are countless number of trees that I've never been aware of before. And so it's like a, a, a mindful moment for me is like, oh, I'm in the car, you know, it's like, let me take my thoughts out of my to-do list and what is Daphne and I talking about today and all, <laughs> all the other stuff. I'm driving my car. Wow, that's a beautiful tree. Look at how that limb branches out on its own. Kind of reminds yeah. me that sometimes I like to go out on my own and stick out and and, and look funny and, and all this other stuff. <laughs> so I just, that was fun. And then the I mentioned that I was at the zoo before we went live today, yesterday reading, and it's the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens. Okay. I was sitting there reading, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, I am very much caught into my picture and my mind of evaluating how is all of this stuff. And it's like, hey, why don't I sit this book down for a minute? And I looked around, all of the sounds, the waterfall feature, or the water fountain feature and then all of a sudden the the feeling of the wind and the yeah. rustling of the leaves and the smell the aroma of these different flat is like oh my gosh i'm <laughs> here at the zoo and i i was i was there 5 minutes earlier but i wasn't there yeah yeah, your attention was someplace else, right? And yes. I love that Thich Nhat Han used to say, when I'm breathing, I know that I am breathing. Yes. When I'm doing the dishes, I know that I am doing the dishes, right? So it's just being in that same place. And and I think what's so beautiful about what you just described, Cliff, is that you develop a capacity to do that over, you know, to do that over time, to bring your attention back to like, what am I doing in this now moment? What's really true? And, I, you know, this, this lives a little bit in Byron Katie's work too, but when I would get, when I would notice, I used to, back in my early thirties, used to struggle with a lot of anxiety, but I would describe as a, a lot of anxiety, <clears throat> couldn't sleep. And what I noticed was when my mind was running off into the future and it was planning and it was concerning itself with just everything that might happen, could happen, everything I need to be aware of, you know, just wanting to control things that hadn't happened. And <laughs> when I would bring my, I'm like, kind of take a step back, I would realize that oh, I'm just a woman sitting. Like nothing else is happening. (laughs) Just a woman sitting. I'm aware that I am sitting. So, you know, becoming aware of like in those moments and then taking the time to look around. You're, You're reading your book. You're in a beautiful setting, which is lovely. Also lifting your head up to go, oh, what is around me now? You know, what's here right now, really? And it's beautiful. It it is absolutely beautiful. And mindfulness is a practice that has brought so much more peace and an end to a lot of stress and rumination that yes. used to be a part of my habitual way of thinking and experiencing okay. the world. I yeah. used to live consistently in the past or Did in the future. Did you really? Yeah. Well, I always lived in the future. Well, so, but I, both, in so. the, both in the past and the future because my future was always projected based upon my experiences of the past. So I was yeah. actually p- 
pulling my past and projecting it into the future. Very rarely was I ever living in the moment. Yeah. Well, me too. But did your mind mostly, you, your mind would go mostly like it would go back and forth past and future. It would go back, back and forth past and future. Yeah. Okay. Mine definitely goes future. It will, it will just run off. (laughs) I lean much more future than I do past, which is so interesting. That's and interesting. As I, yeah, I always like to ask people if they're aware where they spend, where their thoughts seem to spend more of their time if they run off into the I, future or the past. I, what, I think one of the way that I could answer this question, because I've not considered your question before. Yeah. But as I'm evaluating right now, I feel like the answer I've given you is is accurate. If I were to think about what my journaling practice is, which is where okay. I put most of my thoughts into words. My yeah. journaling practice is almost always, this is what I have experienced. This is what has been going on. This is what happened last week. This is what I, and, and evaluating the past. And then, sure. and then it, it, it does shift. It's like, okay, based upon that, now how do I want to proceed moving forward? But that's in your journaling, which is very intentional. So you're in in your journaling, it sounds like you're taking stock of previous experiences, which probably maybe were, you know, a long time ago, but you're taking stock of experiences so that you're learning and processing and then saying, okay, well, what do I take away from that now? Versus um, what I was asking is when your mind is unchecked, where does it seem to go? Like my mind unchecked will absolutely run off into the future and it will just want to plan and control and make sure it, like it just will spend all its time over there. Not all the time, but a good majority. It would lean probably 70% unchecked running off into the future. I'd have, I'm going to evaluate that. I, I'm going to look into it. Yeah. I'd be curious. Just, it's just, I'd like to ask people that because I do think sometimes people have different leanings of how they relate I, to the experience of time. There's, I, there's a part of me that wants to say that I still feel like it's the past. Like at the end of the day, yeah. it, it, I'm like, how? D- okay, so here's what I'll do. Sometimes I will record an entire podcast episode. Okay. If it's not live streamed, nobody in the world knows it exists. Okay. Which I, I've created lots of that. So there's a, it's like, I just created this incredibly awesome piece of content. At least I feel like it's awesome. I'm going to edit and or publish this after I get back from lunch. However, okay. throughout the entire lunch period, I am replaying everything I said in the podcast episode and evaluating, oh, was does this live up to what I want it to be? And when I finish a coaching conversation with a client, I'm evaluating how did that call go did the client experience transformation? Is there anything that I feel that 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 was there that didn't get addressed that I might want to potentially address in the future? And so it, it, I'm, I do find myself evaluating mm-hmm. the past more than I, don't get me wrong. I, I project into the future. Sure. But you might lean more to the past. I, I think I lean more to the past. And I also, when I'm reading, so if you want to ask me, what do I do most of my days? I read, study, and journal. And so when I'm reading, studying, journaling, taking notes, I'm always evaluating what I read in the past. And I'm also, when I'm like, oh, here's a brand new concept, I could immediately jump to how does this actually filter the way that I see my future? No, that's not my first thought. My first thought oh, is I how does my past live up to this stated truth? Okay. And can I find validation for what is being proposed here? Or now that I'm given this perspective, how can I go back and reframe and and see my past differently? Okay, so, so you may lean more to the past. I, yeah. I feel like I actually do. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but it's fun. I don't know what it means, but it's fun. All right. So what's our, so mindfulness as a fluid and evolving practice was summary item number one from season one. What's our second one? Navigating emotional states. So definitely we're also, you and I love playing in this, in this part of the sandbox. So, you know, we talked about what feelings are, sensations occurring in and on the body. Then to your point earlier, you were kind of making this point, we label them, we give them a name. 
because it, you know, it just helps us kind of understand our, our own experience and then talk to others. And if I say to you, Hey, I'm Cliff, you know, I'm experiencing a lot of joy in the moment. You can kind of get with that. You're like, Oh joy. Okay. I don't know exactly what it means for her, but I know what it means for me. And we can kind of understand each other in that way. Um, the other part of this, and this is where we did do a lot with Byron Katie's work, and, and it just keeps coming back again and again, is making that distinction between a feeling and a thought. Right. Right. A feeling is a sensation occurring on the body, and a thought is kind of everything else. <laughs> so Basically. The, yeah, the thought and the words that we give yes. are the label to some sort of, of, of physiology experience, experience yes. that's there. Yes. And then, and we talked about this too, the identification part of it. So I think this fits in great with the, the attachment part. You know, one of what we didn't mention in attachment is we get attached to our quote feelings. We become identified, which sounds kind of crazy, but it's what we do. So I have an experience. I'll use anger because I like that one. Uh, I notice heat in my face. I notice, um, you know, tension in my jaw maybe, maybe some pressure in my chest. I know that I'm experiencing sensations that I would label as anger. And when I'm very attached, then I am angry. Like my identity has become that versus the option to be a little bit looser around it of, I am experiencing these sensations and I would label those as anger. Like I'm experiencing a feeling of anger. Yeah. As an example. Yeah. Annoyance, whatever word we want to put on it. But just noticing where we can become identified with our emotions, I yes. think is yeah, worthy of our time. And if we talk about this as a summary of season one, navigating our emotional states, we talked about the fact that we can have the experience of emotions in the moment, and we can also experience what we would label as an emotional state or an emotional yes. home base. This is, is, it becomes a pattern of being. Yes. Yes. This happened to me yesterday. Actually, I woke up just feeling sort of not with it really. Usually I wake up, I would say majority of the time, very energetic, you know, ready to go. But I woke up in just this weird sluggish sort of space and I felt like I was an old, um, like jalopy car that just couldn't get going. <laughs> you know? I'm aware enough that I know states can come and go. And yeah. I also am aware enough to know like, Hey, you know, you have the opportunity to shift your states too. So I noticed it and it was so curious to me. Um, I didn't, I definitely didn't sleep well two nights before. So I suspected maybe that was some of it. You know, I was maybe a little low on sleep. Fair enough. And I just noticed it kind of, it just kept kind of coming in and out. Um, what the beauty was though, in navigating is that I didn't, I, I was in acceptance of it. I didn't feel the need to have to do anything with it. I had my task list together for the day. I knew what I wanted to get done yesterday. And so I just kept on my way and it was kind of funny at about, it took about three and a half hours, four, almost four hours after I woke up and then it just shifted. Yeah, it was just this energetic, but I, I wanted to bring this up because it's, or wanted to build on what you were saying about the states that we can find ourselves in. You know, I think the, the practice that I was so grateful for in that moment that I knew what I wanted to get done. And I was like, well, can I do those things in the state? Yes, absolutely. I can yep. continue on with my day. It, I, you know, it's just maybe not going to feel so, you know, I'm not going to feel my little bubbly self like I usually do, you know, and I was fine with that. Um, and then it just shifted. So we can get into these sort of places and just I think being aware of it in that my my option in that moment was to just not give it a whole lot of attention and be overly concerned with it and to know that you know I might not feel as my best but I can continue on and get these things done and you know it will be a, it will be a fine day and then it just shifted itself yeah. so interesting yeah I think that's very important that you brought that up yeah absolutely anything yeah. else do you want to say on emotional state management I don't think so. I think just knowing that emotions will come and go, feelings will come and go. If we can be with them and let them be, oftentimes they move themselves. We don't need to become identified with them. So I think that's helpful. Next one, the yes. importance of appreciation and reframing. I love this. Me so, too. One of my favorite <laughs> Tony Robbins quotes is, if things do not go according to your expectation, trade your expectation for appreciation. Yes. Oh, that's so good. Change your expectation for appreciation. Trade it's it. A nice trade it instead trade of change it. it. Change it. it. 
trade it. Trade. I'm going to trade in my expectation. expectation. And I, and I, I, you know what, here, here's my expectation. I give it away. And yeah. in re, and in exchange, I will, I will take gratitude. I will be yeah. grateful. And appreciate what we can learn from those moments. I think that's, that, that is absolutely a, a place that I go. It's like, wow, what can I learn from this? You know, this didn't go exactly as I had preferred which I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of times things don't, (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) you know, and what can I appreciate? What can I learn from this? What can I take away from this? You know? Um, And I, and I lean towards absolutely learning anyway. I enjoy learning. So um, yeah, I just think that's a big one. And there's, and again, I find a freedom in it too, because I just can't know what the future holds. That, you know, we talked about this on one of the episodes too, is just, we think that we know like, oh, this thing is so bad that just happened. This is so bad. Well, you, you really can't know that. You really don't know that because you don't know what it's going to mean two or three days from now or two or three hours from now. So yeah, appreciation, reframing, perspective taking, I would put in there, right? You talked about that at the beginning of the show too. So, yeah. and, and reframing things is it's, basically taking the same scenario, the same circumstance, the same situation without yeah. it needing to change, but the meaning that we're associating to it has yes. changed. Yes. And that, that is, so is something that's always within our control. If, Absolutely. If we're willing to let go of the attachment to the beliefs that we were holding about its meaning in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And the meaning is, I mean, we're just meaning makers. That's what we do, right? Let me go another step further with appreciation. Um, I know having, being who I am, (laughs) a very goal-oriented person, you are, can be a very goal-oriented person and working with people who are, there can be this um, chronic, I would say for myself, there had been a chronic search for always getting to the next thing. Yep. Right? Like, like I'm going to achieve this, this ideal somewhere which by the way, you will never reach because you just keep moving the goalpost. <laughs> and there can be this propensity, at least for me, there was this propensity to not appreciate everything that was here right now. And also not to appreciate how far I had come in my life. So I think this is the next step of, you know, appreciation of being grateful and how important that is to our state of mind and still having goals, still having the things we want to do in our life and ways that we might want to be or things that we might want to accomplish. I'm all for it. At the same time that we hold this consciousness of, wow, what, what is here is, is so great in the moment. And look how far I've come from point A to point B. So I, yeah, I think that's a very worthwhile endeavor Absolutely. on the appreciation and gratitude side. Yep. Okay. Number four, this one, I have a lot of energy around. Um, the role of a compelling vision in personal growth. And I'd say professional growth and development, having a very compelling, as clear as you can vision for your life. And Cliff, I don't, I don't know about you, but for me, when I have, when I take the time to make sure that I'm pretty clear about what do I want to experience in the next three years? What do I want to experience in the next five? It does a couple of things. One, I know that I am 100% responsible for creating that experience. I am no longer thinking that my experience in life is being caused by anybody else when I'm, when I'm creating that vision. The second thing is it has a way of sort of Xing out things then that aren't important to that vision. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when you have sort of like, I want to go this direction Anything that's going to make me go this direction or this direction just naturally gets X'd out. (laughs) It's almost like I don't have to make decisions about those things because those, you know, whatever, whatever the things are that come up, I am much clearer about what fits in. It's going to take me closer to that vision and what's going to take me further away from that vision. So I think when people are struggling and I watch people in a space of, you know, getting stuck in sort of the, the vic, what I would call the victim consciousness, complaining a lot, blaming a lot. What I'm really clear about is there is not a compelling vision for their life. They're not clear about it. And I just would encourage everybody to have, a, have as clear of one as you can create. <laughs> so there are a couple of things that come up to me, come up for me as I hear this, especially for those who hadn't heard our, some of our previous episodes. Yeah. It may sound a little daunting 
the phrase, yes. have a compelling vision for my life. You and I operate in these circles where we think about these kind of things quite frequently, but the, I'm imagining somebody listening is like that i i don't even know what my, i don't know my, about my compelling vision for ne- tomorrow minutes. for tomorrow <laughs> i you know i'm not even sure about a compelling vision for what i'm gonna have for lunch this afternoon <laughs> i don't know about the next three to five years and three to five years gosh if i could I, that would be amazing but my life <laughs> yeah so so i that's the first thing that comes up for me a couple of other things come up for me Number the the next thing that comes up is the idea that one of the values for me of having a vision for the future is having something to move towards so yeah. that I'm not trapped in the moving away from something. Yeah, so good. We talked about this. Like what are we f- freedom to, freedom from? That's exactly yes. right. So yes. when I have a vision of what I want to move towards, and what I like to say is what I want to create next. Yes. And what, and what I add to that is what I want to experience. And what I want, yes, exactly. What I yeah. want to experience. When yes. I have a focus on that, I'm focused on the abundance of the creative aspect of my life. Yes. Whereas if if I don't have that, and I'm at some level of attachment where I'm identified with my persona and and my labels in life, I can v- get easily caught up in these are the things that I don't like. I don't want these things. And how do I get rid of them? Bingo. Which is nearly impossible because <laughs> all you're doing is running away from stuff and there'll be, always be more things to run away from. Yes. So, so that's that's the second thing that comes up for me when it comes to vision. The other thing that comes up for me as I was listening is I probably have in my mind though, and and this could just be my own interpretations of words. And of course, isn't that what we're all doing anyway? Yeah, of course. When I hear, do I have a compelling vision for my life? And the, the, at some level, life in general, yes, I'm here to experience life. I'm here to experience love. I'm here, you know, if, if, if today's my last day, I'm going to enjoy it. If I'm here for 40 more years, I'm going to enjoy it. That's my compelling vision for life. Yeah. At the same time, do I have a 10-year plan of what I want my life to be? Not right now. I don't even... Sure. Right at this moment, I don't even have a five year plan. And at this moment, I don't know that I actually have any like clear thought out idea of I want to be here in three years instead of here right now. There are times in my life when I do have those things. What I currently have is a very compelling vision of the next three to six months. Yeah, And that's what's driving me. And so what I'm getting at, Daphne, is for me right now, I'm experiencing the fullness and the abundance of the creative life, and I feel incredibly fulfilled, and my vision is a three to six months into the future vision. It's not a yeah. vision of my life over the next five, 10, 15 years. And, and yeah. I just wanted, I felt led to share that because that's, that's where, how it's showing up for me right now. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that. I mean, I, I said life, you know, probably, I, know. I mean, yeah. time is always a variable, right? So however people get to it yep, and whatever that time for, it could be a compelling vision for the next week. I don't yes. know. <laughs> right. And I, let me break that down a little bit more because I do think, um, well, and you kind of were leaning into it a little bit, you know, there's, there's the idea of, you know, when it's all said and done and I'm on my deathbed, um, you know, what do I, what do I want to know? If, I, if, if we're to all come to an end tomorrow, what do I want to know about myself? You know, how have I lived my life in a way that is going to feel, I'm going to use the word good, that's going to feel good to me, right? That's going to feel like, okay, I did enjoy this life. I did value this breath that I was given for however many years I was on the planet. You know, I do think, and we've talked about this on the show, having some, some, reverence for our physical being no longer being here is really helpful. (laughs) I think. Um, And, you know, maybe it's not so much. So there's the bigger life kind of thing, right? What are my, what are my wishes on my deathbed, right? How do I want to have been seen? Did I, was I of service to other, you know, for me, I'm just speaking for me. Was I of service to other 
beings on the planet? You know, did I fulfill that part of my, my journey here? So I think there's some of that more so I think to, to distill it down further into the more like, okay, but what about right now? You know, in this moment, yeah. What do I want to experience? What are the experiences I want to have in the next one to two years? You know, what's like I said at the end of last year, like what's one of the experiences, one of the experiences I want to have is doing a show with cliff. Yep. I don't know why. I mean, I really don't. I had some intentions probably, but I just, I just want to have this experience. I enjoy being with you. I wanted to create this show with you. I thought we'd have a really great time doing it. We're both on this, our own journey as well as working with clients, supporting them and their mindsets and supporting them in their businesses and what they're doing. So as coaches, you know, so that seemed like it'd be really fun, you know, and it was so, you know, and is so, you know, so I think even when I say compelling vision, it's sort of like the compelling parts. What do you want to experience in the next year or the next six months or for you, the next three to six months? And when people get clear about that, that what you said it perfectly, like that's the creative process. Now I'm creating in my life, right? Now I'm going to move things forward in a way that's going to feel really good to me and learn, right? The challenges that will come up and learn from that. It's just, it's a different seat than being in life isn't going the way that I want it to go. And I can't get it to go the way that I want it to go. I wish all this other two, you said this perfectly would all, I wish all this, I wish everybody around me would change so I could have the experience I want. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I just, I really encourage people to think about that. What do you want to be experiencing? Maybe it's just next week. Or, or, today. What, or I, today, I I love waking up in the morning and asking myself, what do I want to create today? What yeah. I one of my favorite questions is from the book called The One Thing by Jay Papazon and Gary Keller, I believe. And okay. it's, and the question is this: What is one thing that I could do today that by doing it, everything else would be infinitely easier or altogether unnecessary? <laughs> Yes, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And so when you get really clear about the experience that you want to have in your life, you just, it just drives behaviors. It does. It just does. You just start making different decisions. And you, and again, I think that's the, to me, it's sort of the penultimate of being in a space of being a hundred percent responsible for your existence. Yeah. 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 All right. So we have a goal setting. All those things are important. All right. The fifth takeaway interconnectedness of practice and modality. So all the things coming together, right? So we talk about, and I think I thought this was a really good summary, by the way, So I'm like, oh, of course, so the summary is just put all these things together. <laughs> so the essence of a summary. But I do think that bringing, you know, all the different modalities, we talk about mindfulness practices and meditation and goal setting and visioning and, you know, uh, at journaling and asking ourselves all the questions. I think all of these things in whatever, this is where frameworks become important, I think, but creating your own frameworks for yourself. I want to tell you that I have, as an example, I have this journal that I just, it's a, it's digital that I, or not even journal, it's a planner and I love it. So I can see a full year then I can see it by month and it's, I can click on it and it'll take me to the week. It'll take me to, to just the full week. And I can, I put my to-do list on there and then I can go by day and I'll dive down into each day. And so it, what that does is it just is giving me a framework of how do I hold all this content of my life and what I want to create for the year or by the month or by the week or by the day <laughs> in a space. How do I give it a space so that I can see what I'm doing and where I'm headed you know, and there is some reflection in it too. I can look back at January and see, oh, wow, I had that on my, I had that, I just finished all these classes at the Berkeley School of Music. That was six months, right? And those just ended last week. So just seeing sort of, wow, this is where, where the year was and where I started and, and the season, the season of the podcast, and then bringing all these modalities and practices together. So I encourage people to take the time to do that. I don't have any, you know, there's, I don't think there's any, and I don't know for you, Cliff, if this is true, but this is definitely an iterative process for me. And has been since day one. So, and I think the the place that I find the most sort of like people trying to come up with like one time time management tool, <laughs> you know, it's just very iterative. And I think all of these practices are iterative. You know, you're yeah. just kind of always iterating on them. Yeah. Yeah. What comes up for me under this final category of summary for the season one is we have talked about a lot of different modalities, methodologies, strategies, frameworks, tools, books, and books, and all these different philosophies. When it comes down to it, what comes up for me is 
create your own. Choose yeah. your own adventure. <laughs> Take what you want, any element from anything we've talked about, and pull it into your own methodology and mix it yes. up with somebody somebody else's thing that you and pull it all together. I have these Frankenstein uh, methodologies of my own experiences that is a blend of some of the wildest ex explorations of ancient philosophies with modern yeah. day psychology and very out there esoteric channeled consciousness <laughs> beings. And I was like, I, I love all of the variety of ways yeah. that I can experience life and the way that I perceive it, the way that I experience it. And, and I just love an expansion. I, and, and one of the things that I love is I'm always wanting to, it's the fifth agreement from Don Miguel Ruiz. I, I want to always be skeptical, but I want to learn to listen. And yeah. when I'm listening to somebody who is absolutely convinced that they have found the way yeah. to achieve whatever, I'm like, okay, I'm skeptical, but I'm listening. And what yeah. I love to do is I'm like, okay, I it's like I think you're I, I think I can't find agreement here. I can't find agreement here. I can't find agreement here. I'm I per, I'm open to the fact that you might be seeing, perceiving, experiencing things that I'm not. I think that's great. I'm open to having those experiences if they come up naturally for me or if I feel led to go after them. What I do like, though, is you said this, and you said that you use this question in your journaling. I love that question. I'm not interested in anything yes. else that you had to say for the last hour and a half. <laughs> but, man, that one question's going into my prompt. <laughs> You know, you know, the first place that I started to learn this, that there's like not one way. And I, this is why this is the whole point of the show or whole point of this, the whole point of this point was when I, as you know, I was a practicing physical therapist, you know, for quite some time. That was my first career. And I just remembered like learning about low back pain or something. And there was, you know, this one, one of my teachers like, this is the way you do it. You know, this is, this is the approach and, you know, I'm young and naive. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And then I go on, like, I don't know, six months later, I go to a different course. And that person's like, this is the way you do it. <laughs> I think about very quickly. Oh, there isn't one way to treat this, right? I actually need all of them. And that was when I just started, I realized, oh, yeah, there's not just one way to do any of this stuff. Like, I need to, you know, it's in my best interest, probably, if I want to be really great at my career and at that time, to try to take from everybody. Because one thing that works for one person isn't going to work for another person, and one patient. And they are just seeing it through their perspective and their lens. Yeah. So they could be missing a whole bunch of stuff, too. So, yeah, I learned that. I learned that early on, thank goodness. There's just not one way. And I, and I, and I can respect when people think there is. Yeah. I, you know where this came up for me, Daphne, is when I was a teen, my, uh, th th there were the doctors that says, hey, can you tell me what is the family history of cancer and heart disease and all these other things and blah, 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 blah. Because in their mind, they were trying to convince me that I need to know all of this about my family because genetics will predispose me to having those same things and you're going to need to adjust your lifestyle in preparation for your situation in these scenarios. And I'm like, wait a second, does, does this take into account the the consistent cortisol levels that were going through their bloodstream <laughs> through their lack of emotional intelligence does this <laughs> account for this does this it, you can't just say eating red meat calls this and you know this right. calls this this calls there there's so many different variations of what's going on here yes so yes. it's like hmm that's interesting hmm. You're like, yeah, and you're like, okay, I can see that, and also, I'm not gonna hang my hat on just that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that you're that I'm going to experience everything that my ancestors did. Right. However, I oh, will what? be willing to listen to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to include practices of peace and meditation and joy and fulfillment that as far as I know, 
has not been handed down from generation to generation <laughs> in my family. Let alone exercising, <laughs> sleeping well. I mean, there's so, many, there's so many things. I'm going to choose my own way is what I'm getting yes. at. Choose your own adventure. Yes. <gasps> All right. Well, that's the summary. Those are the top five points. Now, I do want to say it for you who is listening, I did create a little handout that you can print. It's going to be in the show notes that summarizes these. I, you know, it's kind of got a little checklist so you can look under each one of these five points. So I did put that together because I thought that would be helpful. Excellent. And how do people get that? They can go right to the show notes at choose your own adventure podcast.com. Excellent. And they can just click on it and download it and take it away. Sweet. And yeah, uh, yeah thank you guys so much for a 26 episode season. <laughs> That was fun. It's like we we started off with the idea of maybe ten to twelve episodes, and here we are twenty six weeks later. And I'm like, "Hey, Daphne, what do you think about taking the summer off? <laughs> what do you think about season one being done?" Yeah. Well, I love it, and we will come back with season two in the fall, and you know maybe do shorter shorter series of those um, of that episode. But yeah, keep it in seasons. I really do enjoy it. So we yeah. hope that you. We want to thank you for being with us too. Right. Uh, as I said, yeah, and, and really. Whatever you do, it, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I might strongly encourage you to not unsubscribe from this podcast. Yeah. We yeah, we currently sure. are scheduled to come back. I think it's the third week. It's either the middle or the third week of August. So in yeah, the, right. we're coming back in the fall. We're taking the summer off. Just leave us there. If you want to, you can move us down to the bottom of your list. I don't know how you manage all of your different podcast episode uh, subscriptions. However, I would encourage you, stay subscribed. Also, yes. Daphne, where can people get onto your mailing list? And then I'll tell them how to get on my mailing list so they can still hear from us throughout the summer. Yeah, so go to daphne-scott.com. And as a matter of fact, when you subscribe to my list, there is a um, amazing feedback toolkit. So if you, especially if you are a leader working in an organization, and the, one of the number one things that can give anybody tons of anxiety and concern is having to give feedback to their, to, to your team and the people that are reporting to you or to any person in your life. Nevertheless, there is, there are tips and tricks and tools to do that well and to create the best context for that feedback to be received and to deliver it in a way that it can be heard and to continue to drive the performance of your team. So when you subscribe, you will get the feedback toolkit. It will come right to your inbox and it really lays out seven steps and the details in those steps to just get a sense of like, okay, how do I deliver feedback? Well, how do I do that? Most of us are not taught how to deliver feedback to our team. Therefore, <laughs> it creates a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern. And most people just do a reason, take a reasonable move, which is to just not give it or to do the old, I'll just lead by example, which by the way, doesn't really work that well either. So, you know, feedback toolkit, subscribe to the list, you'll stay tuned in. Also, you can find me on Substack um, where I'm doing a lot of writing. Every other week I'm putting a post up there, which is really about, really about thriving in the nine to five, I would say. So I'm talking about a lot of different things with work and, and navigating sort of the overwhelm and the burnout that can come from work. So you can find me, daphne-scott.com subscribe there. You'll be in my uh, list. You'll get emails from me. I wouldn't say I overwhelmingly email my list just when there's very specific things that I want you to know or things that I need to share that I think will be helpful to you. And then find me on Substack as well at DS Leadership Life. Awesome. And links to all of that in the show notes. Yes, absolutely. W wonderful. And what about you, Cliff? For me, I definitely would love to have you join my email newsletter. You can go to cliffravenscraft.com. Right there on the main page, you'll see a little thing where you can sign up to get access for free to my All Beliefs Have Consequences opening keynote to the Free the Dream conference that I had done annually prior to the pandemic. Now it's a Free the Dream course, but this Opening keynote is a one hour keynote that will radically transform your experience of life because it will teach you, number one, what a belief is, how to uncover that 80 to 90% of the unconscious beliefs that cause you to think and feel the way that you're thinking and feeling every day. You'll discover not only how to uncover what limiting beliefs are holding you back, but what the source of those beliefs are. You'll learn how to disassociate from those beliefs and how to condition empowering alternatives. The way that you are experiencing your results in life right now, if there's anything in your life that you wish were different, the only way to get that different result is to take different actions. 
you cannot take different actions long term <laughs> without changing how you're thinking and feeling in the moment those actions are required. And you will never change your thinking and feeling long term unless you change the beliefs that cause the thinking and the feeling in the first place. This one hour talk is absolutely free. It does lead you to my email list. So go ahead and sign up with your email at cliffravenscraft.com. However, the other thing is, is that it's going to offer you the ability to get my entire free the dream online course for free at no charge. And it used to be $197. Actually, it was $497. Then I dropped it to $197. Now I'm giving it away for free. And also, I want to let you know that I do email my list quite frequently. My goal is to email you at least once a week, sometimes two times a week. And maybe, if you're lucky, I'll send you a (laughs) third piece of an incredibly valuable piece of content. You will absolutely look forward to the emails that I send you, though. That's my promise, and I invite you to unsubscribe at any time that it becomes an annoyance. Yes, and I'm on your email list. I get your emails. I find find them very helpful. Also, can I just, can I put a plug in for the Train with Cliff audio journal? Sure. Okay, so for those of you that may not know, I mean, Cliff is, you are, I would say, you know, you, you create the content. You have many podcasts. There's one in particular, the Train with Cliff audio journal where, and I'll let you describe it, but I'm going to talk about what I enjoy about it. Okay. If I'm what I enjoy about it, it's, it's cliff. I I, I want to say it's almost like a behind the scenes, but a little bit. And in the audio journal, cliff is really just sharing, like, here's some things I'm doing in my life. Here's the stuff that's come up in my, in my day. Here's the things I'm doing. And it's just a, it's a, it's a different way that I hear you talk about the things that are going on with Cliff Ravenscraft and the Cliff Ravencraft show and all the different content that you're creating. And for example, uh, in this, I haven't listened to it yet, but you just did one about you letting go of your Kindle and take doing this new thing, which of course the technology piece is in there, but there's also just your mindset. Like you just get to hear sort of like your inner dialogue. So I would <laughs> put in a big, I would, I just personally, I just want to put in a, a plug for the train with Cliff audio journal. And that's a paid um, podcast. I just, I just would put that out there because it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. Well, thank so, you. They, all your podcasts are great. All your content is great. That in particular, I just really enjoy though. So the, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. The train with cliff audio journal is basically the closest thing that you could do to picking up my journal, like a handwritten yeah. journal that yes. I accidentally left at the restaurant <laughs> when my wife and I had our anniversary dinner and then okay. we came back later and it's gone. But now you can read Cliff's inner most secret thoughts. Yes, it now, definitely is. I, I, will, I, I will say that I have a private journaling practice where I'm even more authentic to the core and, and stuff of that nature. However, what I will say is this audio journal is behind the scenes. It is a very raw look into what it's really like for me to experience life as a husband, as a father, as a business owner, as a person journaling, journeying through life, trying to figure out things. All of the things that are going on, I very am very transparent about financial situations. Yeah. I've had months where it's like, oh, okay, guys, I've been averaging $30,000 a month every month for the last 18 months. I've had fifty-five, seventy-five thousand dollar months, and then uh, there have been times it's like, guys, I've been doing this business stuff for ten and a half years, and after ten and a half years, I it, for the last couple of months, it's been under ten k. How does this happen? Well, I know how this happened. Let me explain how this happened. And it's like ah, oh, what a, this yeah, is what I'm going to do. Yeah, I mean, you're you're talking about your business. I mean, it's in the context of you know you're working with solopreneurs. And it's in the context of business, but also mindset. Also, you know, so it's just it's very enjoyable. Everything. It is everything. It's everything. If you yeah, go to tra- trainwithcliff.com, there's an entire sales page that tells you about what everything is included in there, and it is Perfect. it is probably one of the most valuable pieces of content that I do just simply because I I try to not wear a mask that that holds back anything that what I'm truly authentically experiencing yeah absolutely so I just want to put that out there thank you I appreciate (laughs) it you're welcome welcome. I'm gonna need to go change the price now (laughs) yeah 
<laughs> I, it used to be $10 a month and I decided not to focus on it for a long time. So the price yeah. right now is $100 a month or $1,000 mm-hmm. a year. It's worth yeah. it. However, it how many people are going to go sign up for that? I'm not sure. But what I, I, I think what I'm up. actually what I'll, I'm going to go do is I, I probably will go drop it down to $25 a month for the next 90 days. So if anybody wants go. to go get it for 25 bucks a month, you can get it. Go do it. Yeah. Sweet. Well, end of season one, my friend. Daphne, end of season one. This has been a blast. Thank you, everyone, for allowing us to show up into your earbuds or your car stereo or walking with you and your dog, washing the dishes, mowing the lawn, gardening, everything that we've been doing together these past 26 weeks. It has been a joy, a journey, and we invite you to stay tuned until August when we will be back with season two. Until next time, we encourage you to... Choose your own adventure. Bye.